Hello and welcome. I'm Sean Gasper Bai, translator from Polish and a founding member of the Translators Collective, Sedilla and Company. Uh, we're delighted to be collaborating with the Center for Fiction to bring you this monthly series uh, and are grateful for their support. Translation clinics are knowledge sharing open sessions for translators and lovers of translation from all backgrounds and experience levels. Each month, we invite a literary translator to co-host with a member of Sedilla and Company to present or engage on a subject of their choice, followed by a Q&A with attendees. Topics may range from questions and theories of craft to submissions, contracts, and other practical concerns, always with an eye to literary translation as a profession. Attendees are encouraged to bring questions from their own practice. This month, I'm joined by Aaron Robertson, a writer, editor, and translator from the Italian. His translation of Ijiaba Shebo's novel, Beyond Babylon, was shortlisted for multiple awards, including the Penn Translation Prize and the National Translation Award. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Detroit Metro Times, The Nation, Foreign Policy, N Plus One, and more. He is working on his first book, a nonfiction account of African-American utopian traditions. I'll be talking to Aaron about the present and future of translators collectives, how translators can effectively support one another in a challenging industry, and how this fits into the bigger picture of inclusion in translation and publishing. These sessions will be recorded and available for later viewing, and live captioning is available. You can click on the CC button at the bottom menu for various options. We invite you to turn your camera on if you like and settle in for the conversation during which everyone except Aaron and myself will be muted. Please feel free to add comments and questions in the chat, which will be moderated by another member of Sedilla. Uh, tonight we have Allison Mark and Powell, translator from Japanese. Uh, for the second half of the session, we'll open the conversation. If you're comfortable speaking on screen, raise your hand by clicking either at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button and you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. Or if you prefer for Allison to read your question, uh, please send it privately to Sedilla in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them, but we apologize, apologize in advance if we run out of time. For those of us who are unable to attend our live events, we encourage you to email questions or comments before or after the sessions to translationclinics at centerforfiction.org. We hope to make these conversations ongoing to include viewers in as many time zones as possible. So with all that being said, let's, uh, let's get to it. Uh, Aaron, I think you wanted to start us out with a bit of a reading. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, so first, there may at some point uh, the like male person might ring like left to run to my door and let them in. Uh, but besides that, there should be no interruptions. Um, so I think a, a useful place to start is uh, to read a short quotation from a new book that just came out. Um, so Sarah Horowitz is, um, she's been a, uh, a labor rights a uh, advocate for, for many years and um, in 1995, she founded the, uh, um, the Freelancers Union. And so she came out with a book on Tuesday called Mutualism. Um, and it's mainly about uh, kind of her, her vision of how mutual aid networks will be essential to like revitalizing the economy. But the prologue has, I think, a broader um, statement on a recent resurgence of mutual, of mutual aid um, that I think will be helpful, like as we um, we think about what we're talking about now. So I'll just read that to you now. Um, so Horowitz writes, uh, when I finished writing this book in the fall of 2020, I came to see that the mutualist instinct is alive and well. The explosion of mutual aid societies that let communities take care of their own during the worst days of the pandemic the resurgence of an interest in the labor movement, the unprecedented size of the Black Lives Matter movement. At our time of greatest need, we looked to each other and we knew exactly what to do. We kept ourselves safe during the pandemic. We took to the streets to bring about the social change we wanted to see. 
we have changed the ways that we work, the ways that we earn a living, the ways that we get our most basic needs met. We've already been solving our, uh, our own problems and each of us has more agency in today's crisis than we think we do. So just wanted to start with that. Thank you, Art. I, I love that quote because I think it really situates what we're talking about in, in, in a much greater context. Um, I think, I'm sure some people in the audience will be wondering a little bit about uh, the title of this event, like what even is a translator's collective? Um, could, you, could you maybe tell us a little from your perspective, what, what are these things and why, why are they worth talking about? Yeah, um, so uh, to give you all a sense of um, when I started, you know, thinking about what this effort and what this uh, uh, initiative might look like, it really began last summer. Um, I was was back home in Michigan, and the protests were really, you know, just starting. And I recall, like it was la it was was June eighth, twenty twenty, was the day of solidarity, uh, where um, you know more than more than one thousand. I think it was like more than you know 1,300 employees in the publishing uh, industry, mostly junior staffers, um, uh, created a day of action, and it was uh, really encouraging to see um, people come together like in a time where we're all extremely isolated. And I was feeling frustrated, and I I didn't know where I wanted to place my energies really. Um, and so I think I was inspired by a lot of what um, kind of a lot of the collectivist efforts like that we've seen already in the publishing world, like, uh, you know, Kundiman, Kavikanam, uh, Amkanto Mundo. Um, there were these, these systems in place where you have, um, you know, publishing professionals of color who uh, create spaces, you know, for themselves um, to actually create a, a kind of roadmap for people who are new in the industry, maybe, or even mid-career, who um, have felt, you know, a, a, a kind of alienated by largely corporate models um, that, uh, in some cases tend to neglect their very, uh, you know, individualized needs. And I was thinking like, like, we've seen a lot of really wonderful reforms, I think, like in the last few months, um, there have been, you know, some, some salary raises at, at, uh, at certain, you know, publishing houses, there have been uh, kind of senior hires, um, there have been, in general, I think, commitments to um, you know DEI initiatives um, which is all wonderful and all uh, it also it all like serves a purpose and makes this industry a little more accessible but I was thinking about translation specifically and I was thinking about how um, translators like we are part of uh, a sector of the industry that is like, you know, typically overlooked. And I think a useful uh, way to assess just how committed publishers are to the kinds of changes that, um, that are, you know, talked about in, in statements, right? Um, what kind of work are publishers willing to do with people who aren't even their employees, right? You know, people who, often are contractors. Um, are there movements to make, you know, this part of the industry more equitable? And so that is what, what got me thinking about what models can exist. How can we come together when we can't actually, you know, be together? And, and you're in the early stages now of setting up a, a, a collective of, of Black translators, isn't that right? Uh, yeah. Um, Piers and I have been been talking for a while about um, kind of what we want to see, you know, in the industry. And to be clear, like there have been people well, you know, uh, 
before me who have been thinking about this, like who have been thinking about how to bring tr translators of color, um, uh, like how to give you know us more um, you know uh, kind of I think visibility in the industry. So so my own way of thinking about this is just one approach of many approaches um, that are already out there, frankly. Um, and so I was trying to think of what I could bring to this and like what my peers could bring to it. And there's so much um, there's so much like desire to make translation a more more uh, more you know equitable space. And a lot of the people I've been talking to, we haven't you know been in the industry for a very long time. Uh, it's a mix of emerging translators and um, kind of newly established translators too. Um, I think this this notion like that you have to be in the industry for years and years to actually make a substantive change that um, that is false. Yeah, and I know that uh, some of your thinking on this has been shaped by research and writing that you have done on um, on labor organizing movements, um, on on mutualism in in, uh, in your home city of, of Detroit, for instance, on factory floors and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the surface of it, publishing seems like a very publishing and translation seems like a very different place than than those. But you you see strong parallels. Could you talk a little about that? Yeah, uh, it's, um, I think like, uh, like when we're thinking about, um, you know, mutual aid networks uh, in general, uh, like one part of that, you know, tends to be, um, you know, seeking cer uh, certain, uh, you know, like economic, you know, gains and making sure that people are, are you know, compensated fairly for their work, but also, um, it's really about emotional, uh, you know, support too. It's about um, kind of seeing yourself reflected. I think in uh, you know in other people. Um, uh, uh, like when I think about the the kind of labor rights um, movement in Detroit, like what I often think about is you know the the kind of purpose of those early um, you know study groups like that were formed. Um, conversations that that people were having, you know, in in basements, you know, in in one another's homes, like doing readings on um, uh, on on various like labor issues, right? So, a lot of the the action um, that uh, the kinds of like changes that we want to see that's preceded by periods of you know, vibrant um, conversation and discussion. And that's that's the phase like that we're in right now, I think. Like I've, um, we've been having like conversations like over Zoom and um, and really we're kind of at the, uh, you know, the incubation stage. Like I think we have expressed, um, we've expressed a, a vision of like what we hope to see, but really it's all experimental. We don't know exactly like what's gonna stick, uh, but I think in talking through it and in seeing like what has already, you know, been done, not only by the organization like that I've mentioned, but also, um, you know, other translators, uh, collectives that um, that already exist, like that's, that's a really kind of you know uh, helpful way of, of of starting this work, which kind of makes me wonder, Sean, if you wanted to, like, I think it would be helpful for me certainly, but also you know for for people here, if you could talk a little bit about the work that you've done in uh, Sedilla and kind of when were you and the other members like when did you start to think about your own, uh, you know, translation collective, what kinds of, of conversation, like, were you having and how has it evolved uh, over time? Yeah, I, it's it's evolved hugely. Um, Sedilla, I can never quite remember how old we are, but I think we're coming up on five years of Sedilla, mm -hmm. and um, which is incredible, is sort of, is, is 
already is beyond my wildest dreams. Um, we, we, I think it's fair to say we first envisaged Sedilla really as a, as a professional organization. We were modeled on um, cooperative agencies um, that I had heard about from acting friends in the UK. Um, and the thought was, you know, could we have a group of translators in an organized way providing the support for one another that an agent normally provides for an author? Because we sort of saw this as a way that we could scale up our work and make it more economically sustainable. Um, where we've gone in, in the time since then, um, it has ended up being in, uh, I think it's fair to say, in a very different direction. Um, particularly, I should say, since the start of the pandemic, I think. Um, we have, um, we've become, uh, we've, we've always been aware that Sedilla is both kind of a, a as I say, a professional organization and also a community in and of itself. And we've, our members, I think, have grown very close. And that kind of community aspect and even a sort of pastoral care aspect has really come to the fore, I think, in, in the time since the pandemic. But also our status as translators have changed. At the beginning, Sedilla was very focused on getting us, getting our members more visibility and getting ourselves more work. Um, and we're now much more established as translators, and though we, plenty of us still need more work and still need better pay and so on, um, are, we, we're, we're, I think most of us, it's fair to say, are in a much stronger position now. Mm -hmm. And I've often thought that one of the great things about these collective models, these horizontal sort of consensus-based models, is that they are so flexible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're living in such a dynamic industry at such a, a, a dynamic time that Sedilla's ability to be very close-knit and to be so responsive to its members' needs has really, I think, contributed to its longevity and it's what I would like to think is its effectiveness, you know. Um, I, I, one question I have for you is, we spent a lot of time in Sedilla talking about sort of the structures of the publishing world and did we want to be working inside those structures or outside them? Did we want to be trying to change them from within or tearing them down from the outside? Um, and the relationship between the structures of the translation world and of publishing more generally, you know, you have this sort of like nested thing going on. Um, we decided that we wanted to be on the inside um, and we wanted to be seeing what change we could make from within, but we recognize the limits of, of that approach in certain senses. Um, is this something that you've been thinking about in terms of uh, your own early thinking about a collective? Yeah, most certainly, like it's, um... I think about the way the, the kind of various points in my life where, um, you know, entering the publishing world was was not a given. Uh, you know, uh, like even the fact that I could could stay in New York. So, so, uh, so I moved here in 2018, um, but it it must have been in 2017, uh, like when I came here for an uh, for an internship. I wouldn't have been able to do it like if I didn't have a partner at the time who lived here already, who like and her, her you know family kind of took me in you know for the summer, and I was thinking how precarious this all is. <laughs> um, uh, so I got to New York, which is the first step, <laughs> and I had a broad awareness, I think, of uh, of um, like pathways into the industry. Uh, but that is largely because of, you know, the educational resources like that I had access to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm thinking through like all of the things that allowed me to actually be here, right? And um, then I think about how publishing is still, you know, very much a, like a kind of coastal, um, like it has its coastal hubs. Um, cost of living in New York, like as we all know, it, you know, it, it's it, like it can be uh, preventative and uh, like even uh, publishing professionals of color who um, do an internship say, right? They might like it a lot, but uh, the cost of living makes it untenable, you know, to, to, uh, to think about a way forward. And I had my own, you know, uh, like Dark Knight of the Soul last year, <laughs> I think. Um, and so I, 
I think about the importance of mentorship efforts and uh, you know educational outreach is such is such an important part of I think um, retention. Uh, uh, well, like in publishing, it's like it's important to show um, people who might be interested in translation or in other um, jobs in the industry that like yes there are people here, um, there are people here who do the kind of work that you might want to do. Um, and so one of, the, one of the things I would love to work on um, as part of this collective is to, you know, think about how do we actually create a, in, uh, a long lasting pipeline, you know, into this industry? How do we actually like reach out to um, to high schoolers, to people at HBCUs, to people who are in, uh, you know, vibrant creative writing and language programs in uh, places that are, that are, you know, typically, I think, uh, underserved, like by the publishing industry? Um, because it, it's <laughs> like, it's, like representation has its its place, and it's you know it, it's great it's great that hires are being made, and that uh, more books by by authors of color are being published. Um, but even like that number is is still quite small. Um, it's it's easy to make statements, um, but what happens when the protests die down, <laughs> and when people feel you know burnt out? when the statements stop coming out. Um, that's, that's why you need these like, you know, robust like mentorship efforts. Um, you need to kind of form partnerships with, um, you know, literary organizations like that are already uh, doing work with, um, with youth populations and youth groups. So that's something that we're talking about constantly. And like, it's a very, ambitious um, ambitious goal, but it's one that I think is essential to like this entire project. I'm, I'm fascinated by this, I have to say, because I, I totally agree with the emphasis on mentorship. I myself started as a translator because of a mentorship program. Um, but I, I'm really struck by your focus on, on high school, on, on reaching people really early, um, because I think so much of the conversation I see is around, you know, MFA programs and, right. and university education. Um, and I was curious: is there something in your in your own experience that led you to focus on on high school? Is there something about uh, is that is that what's what's informing this? Well, I, uh, uh, so in my like like in my middle and high school, like like there were Spanish language programs there, which in itself again is a privilege too, you know. <laughs> Um, but I, I think in, in looking back, it would have been, been so nice if I had a sense of like, <laughs> of maybe how I could apply this in a creative way and not just kind of, you know, um, like, like, I, you know, I'm taking a Spanish class. Great. But I, uh, like I'm a, a kid who is distracted and doesn't like really, um, and maybe like, this is just me, like, um, like these are my shortcomings, but um, I I think now about how amazing it would have been if um, someone from the publishing world like stopped by the class or you know talked. Uh, well, um, nowadays uh, like that would happen, you know, over Zoom maybe. But um, what it would have been like if we could have spoken to people who. Took these interesting paths, you know, with their languages, and and actually like applied them in a way that was interesting, and and that that uh, that kind of you know bred creativity. Um, I I think that like there is so much. Um, young people are so creative, and we uh, there's a huge rift between this like broad population and the publishing world. Um, and I just, I think it needs to be, um, there needs to be kind of new, new bridges that are formed, especially with translation. Um, 
because we are such a relatively, I think, small community, um, I, I know that there's a lot of like desire to actually um, make sure that that people know that tra uh, translation like is something that that you can do, like whether that is for, you know, a job or um, if it's just like a passion that you want to uh, to cultivate, you know, during your life, like there's so much kind of value to that and thinking about, you know, also the merits of, um, you know, intercultural communication and, and uh, kind of it, uh, you know, it kind of fosters and encourages empathy, like all of these, these skills that um, translation encourages uh, need to kind of be explored more. Um, we've only got uh, a few more minutes, I think, before we need to to move mm -hmm. over to the Q&A. Um, so I was wondering if I could close out with a question in a slightly different direction. Um, there, last month, we had a really wonderful, um, a really wonderful discussion about the relationship between translation and writing. Mm -hmm. um, I am only a translator. I don't do my own writing, but I know that you are a writer, you're a journalist, you're an editor. And I was wondering if you could talk a little about how your translation practice relates to, to your other writing and artistic practices. How do you see them situated with one another? Yeah, it's it's funny because like I I can't at this point I can't really imagine my own, you know, writing life and my own kind of editing career without without translation <laughs> because uh, translation like was my way, you know, into the industry. Um, translation has most certainly made me a, a better, you know, writer, but also it has, it, like when you realize how many stories are out there and how many stories still have not, you know, uh, been told, and then you see things that are like, <laughs> like you see the same stories being told and put out, it's like we have no, there's no excuse for this, frankly. Um, there is so much out there. And I think that, um, yeah, like I would say that my uh, being immersed in this like rich, uh, rich area or rich, you know, sector of publishing has um, really upped my, my standards, I think, like for the stories that I want to tell, like in the stories like that, I um, hope to um, facilitate in some way. That's fantastic. Um, I, uh, I think it is time for us to move on to the next stage of our event here. Um, so as, uh, as we move into the Q&A, we invite you to turn your camera on if you like. Uh, and to repeat, if you're comfortable speaking on screen, raise your hand by clicking either at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button. And you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. Uh, or if you prefer for Allison to read your question, please send it privately to Sedilla in the chat. Uh, we'll try to get to all of your questions, but we apologize in advance if we uh, if we don't have time. Uh, Allison, do we do we have any questions on deck? Um, we don't have any questions yet. So, um, we can keep talking. Everybody, you know, set come on. <laughs> Join the conversation. So, oh, we have someone has raised their hand. Oh, here we go. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> um. Hi, and good evening to all of you. That I wanted to ask. Um, personally, I don't live in the U.S. I live in Puerto Rico, and I wanted to ask, since sometimes opportunities that are a bit harder to come by where I'm from, how valuable would you say? With like that opportunity of like a mentorship or like an internship, like how valuable was it to you and how did it help you like grow into the position that you're in now, you could say? Like uh, if there are words. Yeah. <laughs> like I know you need like a lot of street knowledge for like to say you need to like practice mm -hmm. a lot and participate a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um mentorship was was so important for me. Uh so I, so my kind of initiation, like into the industry, was through Alta, through the uh, American Literary Translators Association, and I, I met people who, who helped me um, learn about, uh, you know, 
publication opportunities. Um, people would point me towards uh, editors who I should speak to, you know, with my projects. They, they, they helped me think through um, uh, the kinds of projects like that I might work on. So, you know, like mentorship has, it's, it's really kind of, you know, fundamental, especially in, in industry that can be pretty, um, there's a lot of nepotism <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of elite networks that I have, uh, you know, like benefited from, like I have seen the mechanics of that. <laughs> and I think that um, it is imperative that if you do have access to those resources, that you share them in some way, that you, that you, um, uh, uh, you know, spread the wealth. Um, the, the challenge, one of many challenges, I think, is that ultimately, you know, uh, uh, especially for, for publishing employees of color too, um, that work of mentorship is often unpaid, it's voluntary, and, um, like it can, it is often, you know, justified, I think, like as a labor of love, like, which is fine. Like I love doing this kind of thing, but um, that should not be an excuse for, for publishers to, uh, to just say, okay, well, um, we have this, this kind of cadre um, that is working like on these issues. So we don't actually have to, you know, put in that work. Um, so mentors are really important. <laughs> um, we don't have any other questions at the moment. So uh, I know Aaron and Sean, you had lots to talk about. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I will very happily ask a question, <laughs> um, which is uh, one that I always ask myself. So I'm really curious to hear what you say, Aaron. Um, uh, you, we're talking about these huge issues here tonight, you know, we're talking about these gigantic structural issues. And I feel like when we're, um, when we're looking at addressing questions of, of structural inequality and, and, and structural racism and, uh, and lack of access and, and so on, um, as, a, as somebody who's looking to address some of these problems, it can feel like everywhere you look, there are more problems. Yeah, and right. um, so how do you how do you pick and choose? How do you focus in on, on where you can make a difference? How do you, how do, you do that, that targeting, knowing that you on your own can't, uh, can't fix all of this? Well, I can speak you know, very concretely about that. So, so last month in, uh, in Words Without Borders, I published a piece um, kind of that you know, outlined a lot of what we're talking about now and um, I had hoped that people act like people would read the piece and then reach out and, and, and kind of start start conversations. And many people did, which was encouraging. So I've been in touch with um, you know editors uh, at mostly uh, you know indie presses and also uh, literary magazines who have said like we are ready f uh, like like we are interested in s supporting you and. Um, uh, you know, kind of being there for you, like when, like when you're ready, um, which is great. I've had some wonderful conversations, like with people who have experience um, in, uh, you know, fundraising. Um, who, uh, people who have run, um, gosh, uh, you know, like publishing incubators and all that stuff. So I'm kind of like in that phase where I'm just having really vibrant conversations with people who are are thinking about you know similar issues um, and really that's 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 kind of where you start <laughs> um, there's there there's no no one map you know to this it, it kind of depends on um, the people that are that make themselves available to you uh, and so if there are you know any any publishers here <laughs> please reach out after me uh, I'll reach out, you know, after this conversation, but that's how it starts. And I think the way that I'm thinking about it, there are two major sides, like which I talked about the educational part of this whole effort and um, 
the representational side, which starts with like learning what, <laughs> where are all the black translators? Like I, <laughs> it's a question I've asked. I don't know the answer. I could not you know, like, you know, give you even a ballpark of um, the, you know, um, the group of translators who are working now. Um, and like that, that's unfortunate. I think that, um, that there should be a, a kind of, you know, centralized location where um, translators who are, are looking for each other, frankly, who want to know what other people are doing, the kind of work, you know, that interests them. Like, where are they? Um, I, my own focus is on uh, Afro-Italian, you know, literature and history. And for a while, I, I wondered what other work was being done in that space. And then I met some wonderful, you know, translators, uh, two, um, two Black women who are, are kind of um, doing like wonderful work in that space. And I met them kind of by chance. Um, but if there's something more, more systematic that people can turn to, that would be so wonderful. Yeah, and that, that I can vouch for that article in Words Without Borders. It was really fantastic. And I saw that um, I think Alex and, and, and Karen shared the, the link to that in the chat. And I really, um, I encourage everybody to, uh, to check that out, everybody who's here tonight. Um, Allison, do we, do, we have any, do we have any more questions that have come in? No? Keep going. OK. I've, I've, I have a really big one. Then. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, wait. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> If there are going back to a bit on like the mentorship part, I was like able to find an internship over here, but it kind of fell through because of the pandemic. So I wanted to ask, like, what dynamic do you would you personally look for in an internship, or would you want from a mentor? Like, would it be like something more hands on, or like what would you expect for something like that to be? So I'm doing. Uh, I am am currently a part of this, uh, this like informal, uh, you know, mentorship group now actually, uh, where I am mentoring somebody. And that's like, that's just um, that we, we meet, you know, a uh, couple times a month. Um, we talk about, so we start like with a piece that um, the person wants to actually like translate. We'll work through the actual mechanics like of the piece, but then we talk more broadly about, okay, who, who should you get in touch with, right? Uh, like what, what kinds of, what kinds of people uh, do you need to be in touch with to ensure that, that you get published and that you start to build a network of people who know your name. Um, it's, you know, uh, uh, vi you know, visibility is, is a huge part of this. Um, I think that Publishers in general just don't don't always know um, who is out there, the kind of people like who are looking for uh, for opportunities, and so like that I think is is probably the most most useful part of those those mentoring relationships is to be be some kind of a guide to be a person that you can um, just talk openly with, uh, yeah. Quickly for myself, um, one of the most important things that my mentor did for me was was teach me things like uh, how to negotiate a contract, what a proper rate was, what rights I had, um, how to pitch projects to publishers. Um, they're the whole um, kind of nuts and bolts of of, of doing this job, and uh, which has been invaluable is are lessons that I still find myself implementing today. Um, um, so. Uh, so Allison, we actually have a couple of people who, who have questions, uh, Brianna Zimmerman and, and Eliana. And... Yes, so I'm sorry, I need to find Eliana to unmute her. And hi to both of you, it's nice to see you. <laughs> hi Erin, it's nice to see you. Um, so I'm I'm here sort of, I wear lots of different hats. Erin um, and I know each other from um, my agenting life where I represent um, projects in translation mostly out of Spanish. 
Um, but I also, because I used to edit and translate from Spanish, I teach translation in Columbia's undergrad um, creative writing program. So this is something I think about a lot and, and I'm just sort of spitballing here and it's, I'm thinking out loud, but when you talk about, you know, what are, what are like concrete constructive um, cultural or systemic shifts that, that we can all make those of us who are in positions of guiding students, whether in my case, it's undergrads or, you know, a lot of um, translators and writers are in positions to be teaching in these um, creative writing MFA programs or language departments, whatever. Um, something I think about a lot that could be sort of experientially meaningful and also productive is I wonder what the opportunity, and I'm thinking this because I've mentioned this to you, Erin, I have a friend of mine who's Afro-Colombian and is starting a collective of Black translators in um, Colombia, in Latin America. What are things we can do to start thinking about um, mentorships across um, like co-translating, right? I know that sometimes Susan Bernofsky in the MFA um, in the graduate program has students pair up um, sometimes with someone in um, the, the language of origin, right? So that there's also a cultural exchange happening. And, you know, when I get students in my undergraduate classes who are saying like, I'm, an, I'm a heritage speaker of Spanish, but like, I don't know where to start. What should I be reading? How wonderful would it be? And I'm now thinking in retrospect, having not yet done this to say like, I'm gonna put you in touch with this friend of mine in Mexico City who yeah. is really active in their local literary community. Or I'm gonna put you in touch with this person in Bahia who can tell you who the cool Afro-Brazilian poets are. Like, what are ways in which we can start thinking both for ourselves as people who are working in this industry that is so like thought of as the castle on the cloud to yeah. open access and open engagement to people beyond our borders that are also beneficial for people just starting out here who are trying to translate out of those languages because there's a cross-cultural piece that that I think is really interesting that and that's a way to also I don't know I, I'm I'm still it's still a thought in formation but I just think that there like there are alliances that could be made there um yeah help gain access in a lot of different ways and and I don't know yeah totally and uh, so I actually have a, uh, a friend, like, and I, unfortunately, I can't say much about their work, but um, I will, uh, like, say his name, uh, Aaron Coleman. He's a, a, a wonderful translator from Spanish. He's also from, from Michigan, so, like, you know, close. But um, he, he, he is working on something really exciting that I think has the potential to, to really kind of be... Um, to serve as as a kind of infrastructure for the kind of of goals like that we're talking about here, and really to have a kind of centralized place where where translators across borders can be in touch and where people can can actually like just look up. Okay, who who is who is working on you know some kind of new new trend or new, um, like, I don't know, in exciting, like, writing form in, in, in you know, in, in Germany or, right, you know, uh, like, it's a place to actually, like, connect people and work along, like, that lines is happening now, which is very exciting. <laughs> so I, I can't wait for the day that, like, we can learn more about it and, and talk about it. But people have been been thinking about that exact thing um and so i i think it's only a matter of time before that kind of bridge um is is formed uh which is very very exciting there was i don't know if uh brianna merman she has a question brianna okay great Hello. Hi, Hi. I'm Bree. Hi, it's nice to meet everybody. Um, this is super fascinating. I'm an emerging translator from the Arabic and French, and it was really fascinating to hear your guys' conversation about all this. Um, I guess I was wondering if you guys could talk more about kind of how you're creating a, a hub, like what an actual hub would look like. Like, it's, is this going to be 
a website like like what is what is the actual vision for all of this like where is it going like Aaron you were talking a little bit about how you guys do have a vision for this how you know there's conversations happening how there's going to be something produced but is there kind of a concrete organization is there is there some kind of like how how is this going to be structured and, and systematized ultimately yeah that uh, so I was alluding to it very like very very vaguely like in my last response like there's there is stuff happening but I'm, I can't unfortunately talk about it's so unsatisfying right now but like ideally there would be a website that people have access to um, that like provides a lot of different resources and information um, that is like one one side of things and that is probably the side of the you know the aspect of this that will first kind of be made available to the public. Um, the timeline for that though is is still kind of up in the air. Uh, so I, I know it's vague and not not very satisfactory, but um, there is a, a like concrete vision in place. It's just um, I, I think it's it's still a little too early to to talk too much about it. This, this might be uh, an annoying follow-up, but mm -hmm. so there is going to be something where maybe there's some kind of membership or there's some kind of working together. And then is there a sense that there's some kind of hope for both you and Sean, actually, that mm -hmm. there's going to be some kind of conversation about, I guess, Eliana, you were kind of talking about this too, about how we're kind of bringing translation into wider culture and how we're thinking about what translation means in wider culture and kind of both like the theories of translation, but also like, like are, are you guys thinking of producing journals? Sorry, those are such vague questions, but it, it, I'm curious about kind of how you, you want to apply that to bringing the thoughts about translation further into culture too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Sean, um, do you want to, so I'm, I mean, I'm curious because like with uh, Sadilla, I noticed like that you all, um, I think you all, you know, started off as a collective, like that was mostly um, aiming to promote, you know, the, um, your work, like as translators. But then over time, your uh, your kind of outreach efforts grow, and you have events, you know, like this through the center, uh, you know, for fiction. So, how um, like, are there kind of other projects that you all have talked about or, you know, thought about that you like plan to, um, that you will do soon or like, can you talk about that or no? Uh, well, I mean, the, well, this project is going to continue for the rest of the year. And yeah. that is plenty to keep us busy for the time being. Um, I, you're right to say that Sedilla started being very industry focused. And we, while we did plenty of, of public events, they were always, geared towards publishing professionals and they're always made with publishing professionals in mind. And that is something that we have been reconsidering over the last, I would say, year or so. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, you know, our own position within the industry has changed as our perception of, what, of the needs in the industry um, and among our colleagues have changed. And I think, I think we're feeling more of a commitment to um, to be playing kind of a, 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 I don't know quite how to say this, but to be playing kind of a community role um, and to be thinking about how we can use the, the experience and the knowledge and the contacts and the platform, frankly, that we have um, to help kind of, you know, uh, to help support other people in the community. And that's definitely some of the thinking behind, behind this series and um, why we're hoping that it will reach out to people who haven't yet had access to, to the translation community. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, um, so new projects, I don't know. We, um, the, the other thing about Sedilla is we're all working translators, you right. know, and um, we all only have so much time and, and we only have so much money. And we've had to be very strategic about the kinds of commitments that we can make, um, which uh, occasionally brings us crashing down to earth, but is also, a process that I've really learned to trust. When we try to do something and it doesn't work out, I think it's often because we've bitten off more than we can chew and we're better off kind of taking a step back and recollecting ourselves and thinking, okay, what what can we actually achieve here? Yeah, and I think like I, um, a lot of my peers and I are still kind of like in the dreaming phase a bit. <laughs> so we like, 
there are a lot of ideas that we we do think actually can happen, but the time, you know, like time will tell. Um, and it's encouraging to that to like that we have have gotten in touch with people who do want to like support this kind of work. So we have people out there who you know who want to help, who want to be a part of it, and that's nice. Um, we will just see, you know, like where it goes, frankly. I, I see we have somebody with a hand up. Uh, Anaris, is that? Yeah. <laughs> Hang on. We'll yes. On. Yes. Hi. Good Hi. evening, everyone. Um, I too am completely fascinated by this conversation. This um, information was forwarded to me because just recently I've been uh, awakened, sort of to say to this passion of translating. I'm a language teacher. I love that you mentioned high school because I'm a high school Spanish teacher. My degrees are in Spanish language and then in Spanish language education. I am interested in this, in the business of translating because I am also a big reader. And there are things that I find I'm reading and of course I'm limited, you wanna share that. But uh, so I have a passion, but how does one get started? I'm not by any means. I hear that some of you, you know, many translators do their own writing. They do editing. I'm just, you know, knowledgeable in the grammar, the vocabulary. I love reading, but how does one get into the business of translating and being a part of sharing stories? Yeah. Um, how do you start? Obviously, even if it's um, just with projects, how do you come up with a project and who do you show it to? How does it, how does it take off? <laughs> yeah, Sean, that sounds like, uh, and do you want to like start with this one? Like that's what your whole, I mean, that's what your work is about. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, gosh, I mean, it, it starts with reading a lot, I think. Um, and uh I, well, I can, why don't I, I'll, I'll talk about myself a little bit. I mean, with me, it, um, translation was something that I started, I was interested in languages since I was in high school. It was something that I thought about doing, but never really considered a career. Um, I started doing it during a, an extended period of unemployment, basically, as a way to get some odd jobs here and there and just completely, completely fell in love. Um, and, um, had the good fortune to be connected through uh, through uh, one of my college professors with a professional translator um, who sat me down over coffee and grilled me about my reading habits in Polish. And uh, we discovered we had some interests in common and she uh, lined me up with, with, my first, with my first couple of assignments. Um, and it's sort of, it's sort of gone from there. I mean, as I said, that mentorship relationship from the very beginning for me was, was really essential. And I realized that's something that not everyone has access to. But I think um, reading a lot, looking for texts that speak to you, trying things out, getting a feel for it. You know, I had done kind of amateur translation on my own in little bits and pieces over the years in language classes in high school, in college, uh, and so on. And that was I think that was the thing that kind of can, you know, planted the seed that that this might be something that I that I would want to do later on. Um, how, what what about you, Aaron? I, I realize I don't know that much about uh, about how you came to translation. Well, it's a it's a, you know it's a really uh, unusual path because I my first translation was um, a kind of college thesis project, like which is not not the standard approach. Um, there is no one approach really, but mm. I think often translators try to just, you know, get get credits, at, uh, you know, under their name. They they might start start with um, with a short story or like a short essay even, and try try to publish those on on websites or um, you know literary journals and and magazines. Um, and then, you know, from there, you might start to uh, make connections like with publishers, but it's uh, like that is just one path of many, frankly. And, you know, the question becomes like, how, uh, 
like how do you learn about you know which journals you want to um, submit to? Like where do you find that that information? And and also so the American um, uh, you know Literary Translators Association that's a great place to start. Um, there's gosh just the the poets and writers uh, database. Like if you go on their website. They have a really comprehensive list of of literary magazines that 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 tell you like what kinds of submissions they accept. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but does does Pen America like also like have a? Yeah, they have a resource list on their website. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I uh, and I believe the Authors Guild has a resource list as well. Um, oh, and I see some of the some of my colleagues are posting some of that information in the yeah, chat. Yeah, great. Yeah, um, thank you. There's, and there's a number of really wonderful online magazines that are devoted to literature and translation. We mentioned Words Without Borders, which was my first yeah. uh, publication and I think was many, many translators' first publications. Um, there's also Asymptote um, and there's, there's a number of others. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's everybody, everybody has a different path. And I think it's something that a lot of people kind of fall into Kind of by accident through being in the right place and at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time depending on your point of view <laughs> yeah and uh anaris i'm going to actually message you my my uh email address in case you want to contact me in fact like what i'll do is like i'll, I'll put it in the general in case people want to get in touch because i would love to continue these kinds of conversations um offline which and it, it seems like we're also about to to, to come up to uh, yeah, I'm 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 afraid we're uh, the, the the sands of time are drawing swiftly swiftly to a close. Thank you here. so much. <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you for your wonderful question and for joining us. Um, in 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 our remaining few minutes, we've been um, uh, in in this series, we've been posing one question to all of our to all of our uh, our guest hosts here. Um, and so, Aaron, I I want to ask you. Um, what would an ideal future of literary translation look like to you? Hmm. I think um, it could be simple. <laughs> it could be a future where um, people know that, you know, from a relatively young age, that one, these paths are available to them. And if they want to know more, they like, they can know where to look without having to jump through a million hoops, without having to move to New York, um, without having to go to school at an elite institution. They can just go on Google <laughs> and find the information they want. Um, it sounds it, like it, it's simple, but it, it will make a world of difference once people um, know where to turn. Absolutely. I think that's I think that's a great thought to end on. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you again to the Center for Fiction for hosting these clinics. Uh, and thank you, Aaron, for joining us tonight. Translation clinics will take place on the third Thursday of every month. Please sign up to be notified of upcoming events. Next month in March, Sora Kim Russell and Alex Zucker will be discussing translation as a collaborative art asking where translation ends and co-translation begins. The registration link is in the chat and on the Center for Fiction's website. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Please stay safe. <laughs>